Hello, everybody. Welcome to lab for Thursday, March 26th. Today's lab is going to cover viruses. Uh, we'll be talking mainly about three viruses. The first is the Epstein-Barr virus. Then we're going to talk about current events a little bit and um, delve into SARS-CoV-2. And then we're going to talk a little bit about Ebola. So just some general information about viruses. Viruses are acellular infectious agents, which means these are things that can cause infections, but they are not cells. And because they're not cells, they're not really considered living organisms. They're also very small, much smaller than bacteria. And if you look at this image over here to the right, this is showing us uh, a comparison in size between a human T cell, which is one of our white blood cells, a bacterial cell, and the HIV virus, which is shown as these little specks. This video is meant to give you a sense of the scale of viruses. So we zoom in from a grain of salt. We see a human T cell. Um, we see a little bacteria cell hopping around. And then the very, very small red specks, both floating around and on the T cell, are the viruses. They consist of a protein coat that surrounds a nucleic acid core. So viruses can have either DNA or RNA in their core, and um, just different kinds of viruses have one or the other. The viruses multiply inside living cells using the cell's machinery. And when I say machinery, I think the cell's enzymes. So for example, if a virus needs to make a lot of copies of its DNA, it's going to use that cell's DNA polymerase to do that. After a cell is taken over by a virus, the virus will start multiplying. And after the virus is multiplied, they'll destroy that host cell and then move to the surrounding cells or eventually out of the hosts to get to another host. The first virus I want to talk about today is called the Epstein-Barr virus. The Epstein-Barr virus is one of the pathogens on your pathogen chart. So make sure that you go to your pathogen chart in your lab manual that's lab number 29, and fill out the information for the Epstein-Barr virus. The disease it causes is infectious mononucleosis. And I just want to take a second here and clarify that there's a difference in what we call the um, organism or the virus that causes a disease and the name of the disease itself. And a lot of times people get those kind of combined or confused. The disease describes what the group of signs or symptoms are that are um, causing a problem in the human body. So when people have the signs or symptoms um, of this Epstein-Barr infection, we call that disease infectious mononucleosis. But the thing that actually causes infectious mononucleosis is the Epstein-Barr virus. So the etiology is a virus. It's um, also known as the human herpes virus 4, and we use that name to show that it's related to other human herpes viruses. Um, so either name is correct. It's transmitted from person to person through saliva and blood products, and the best way to prevent it is to avoid other people that are acutely sick with it. And when I say acute, that means they're showing signs and symptoms of the disease. When we're diagnosing mononucleosis, one of the things we can do to look for the virus is look for evidence of the damage it causes to cells. Because viruses are very, very small on their own, you can't see them without an electron microscope, which is not a piece of equipment that's in every medical lab. So instead, we look for signs of the virus in the body. And we do that by looking for a type of cell known as a downy cell. Now, a downy cell is a lymphocyte, which is a type of white blood cell. A normal lymphocyte looks like this one down below. So it's a round cell um, with this staining that, that's used for this micrograph. The nucleus of the lymphocyte stains dark purple, and it has a big nucleus. And then um, the cytoplasm stains light, light purple. So a lymphocyte has a very large nucleus compared to a cytoplasm. It, you can just see a crescent of the cytoplasm around the nucleus. A downy cell is a misshapen or deranged lymphocyte. So you can see here that this um, is no longer a circular cell. It looks like it's been smushed and, and the shape is messed up. So if you look at a blood smear of somebody with symptoms of mononucleosis um, and you see downy cells, that would be a way of diagnosing that yes, they do have an Epstein-Barr virus infection. 
So the other viral disease it makes a lot of sense to talk about right now is the coronavirus disease that's come to be known as COVID-19. And um, some of you are may be aware that I did a presentation along with some other microbiology faculty to the campus. And so I just wanted to share a little adaptation of that presentation. So this screenshot is some of the latest data that's come out about COVID-19. Um, this was pulled off Johns Hopkins University website on March 25th. And if you want to go there and see um, the current information, you can always use this link. And that will give, they're constantly updating this. So as of today, which I'm filming this on March 25th, there are nearly half a million confirmed cases, 458,000. So that's worldwide. The total number of deaths is 20,807. And just to give you an idea of how rapidly this is currently spreading, um, when I looked this up last night, that number was at 18,000. And then in the afternoon um, today, that's, that number has already risen by two more thousand. And that again, that's the number of deaths. Uh, you can see that Europe is really hard hit right now. Um, most of the deaths that have been suffered during this pandemic have occurred in Italy, followed by Spain. And so you're seeing a lot of hot spots in Europe right now. So we are in the midst of an outbreak. In the United States alone, there's over 55,000 total cases. And again, that uh, number is rising constantly. Now that we've looked at the latest data, let's look at what COVID-19 is. So the COVID-19 is the name of the disease. It's a respiratory infection. The etiology is the virus that has been named SARS-CoV-2. So again, we're, I've noticed in the press it's called COVID-19 a lot, and a lot of people are using that to refer to the actual virus and the disease, but the really correct thing to do is call the virus SARS-CoV-2 and the disease COVID-19. So COVID-19 describes a number of respiratory symptoms that's caused by this virus. The mild symptoms include um, a fever, a cough, and tiredness. And those are the typical symptoms seen in about 80% of people, including most children and young adults. About 15 to 20% of people have more severe symptoms that would cause them to be hospitalized. And those include pneumonia, shortness of breath, especially in older people with um, pre-existing conditions like heart disease, lung disease, diabetes, high blood pressure, and cancer. We don't have a pharmaceutical treatment for this, so there's no medicine that's shown to be effective. Um, so mainly what we do is supportive care. In the hospital, people would be on ventilators to help keep their blood oxygenated um, while their lungs are damaged. So coronaviruses are um, as a family of viruses, and um, there's some really common coronaviruses that are in circulation. When you get the common cold, there's a lot of um, viruses that can cause the common cold. It's estimated that about 10 to 15 percent of common colds are caused by coronaviruses. So it's a very good bet that all of us have had a coronavirus infection. Coronaviruses are most commonly spread in the winter. We don't exactly know why that is, but that does seem to be the case. So if you look at this figure here, um, coronaviruses are most common December through April. We do not yet know if this new coronavirus, which causes COVID-19, is most common in the winter or not. Um, hopefully, uh, the disease will slow down or the spread of the disease will slow down when warmer weather comes, but uh, we just really don't know if that's what's going to happen. So as I said, COVID-19 is caused by a new strain of coronavirus named SARS-CoV-2. When we say a new virus, it means that it recently moved from a virus that was spread around in animals, and it's thought to be spread around in bats, most likely, and then um, was able to jump into humans. So a human got it from an animal. It seems to have undergone some mutations that have allowed it to be passed from person to person. So we do know about other coronaviruses that can be deadly. Um, perhaps the best known one is uh, the Middle Eastern virus or Middle Eastern respiratory virus or MERS. That one has a, a high death rate. Almost all the cases we know about from MERS come directly from camels, although there is some low amount of transmission from human to human. 
Another disease that's caused by the coronavirus is SARS. And that was a disease that had an outbreak in 2002. Um, mostly that was contained in Asia. It spread a little bit around the world, but eventually died out um, through containment. The thing that's so different about SARS-CoV-2 is that this virus is much, much better than either SARS or MERS at spreading from person to person. And that's the reason it has spread so much throughout the world. One thing we do know about coronaviruses is that they spread through droplets. What that means is that infected people can spread the virus to non-infected people through little bits of saliva or mucus that um, come out of the mouth or nose. So as you can see in this picture, this is a, a um, picture of somebody sneezing and all these little droplets coming out of his mouth are the type of droplets that could carry coronavirus. Um, the thing about these droplets is that the droplet, the ones that are big enough to hold coronavirus usually fall to the ground within three feet. So in order to avoid getting the coronavirus from people through casual contact, it's suggested that we keep six feet away from other people. And that's just to um, ensure that any droplets that might come out of their face will fall to the ground before they land on our face or on our hands. So you can get coronavirus by breathing in respiratory droplets from somebody. It can also be spread from person to person um, through other touch, so hands. Um, so if you shake hands with somebody and if they have some coronavirus on their hands, it could get on your hands or it can occur through touching contaminated surfaces like countertops or doorknobs and then transferring that virus from your hands to your respiratory tract either through your mouth nose or eyes the other thing that's really important is making sure we don't transfer the virus from our hands to our face and so that's why hand washing is so important use of hand sanitizers is also helpful if you don't have access to soap and water and then we also try to clean and disinfect surfaces with um, things like Clorox wipes or um, bleach. So we can avoid transferring the virus from a surface into our um, respiratory tract. We also try to control our droplets. So covering sneezes and coughs with our elbow or tissue. And then just avoiding all of that close physical interaction like handshaking and hugs. Right now we're saying stay home everybody, but that's especially true when you are sick. And because there is no treatment or no medicine to cure COVID-19, we're really relying on our immune system to help us get better if we do get sick. And so one, we just should support our immune system any way we can through adequate rest, eating healthy foods, taking vitamins, making sure we're well nourished. Um, it's been suggested that if you do get sick, you should call your doctor, um, especially if you're elderly or immunocompromised. It's important as, when there's an outbreak like this to call the doctor first because um, hospitals are starting to get overwhelmed and also being in a healthcare setting is can cause great risk to everybody else in that healthcare setting. The good thing about calling is that you cannot spread the virus over the phone. So it's important to, to make a call to your healthcare provider if you do suspect that you have coronavirus. Most likely, if, you're, um, if you have mild symptoms, the doctor will just tell you to stay home and take care of yourself. The main reason we're social distancing is to try to slow the spread of our infections. So what this graph from the New York Times is showing is that if we don't do social distancing, the number of cases will rise very quickly and they will hit a peak before they slow down or they start to go back down. If we reach that peak, um, in a short amount of time, our healthcare system will be overwhelmed. So this dotted line here shows how many people can be treated by our healthcare system as it stands now. So if this, if it continues to spread rapidly, um, there will be a lot of people above this uh, limit that can't get adequate healthcare. And if we don't have adequate healthcare with respirators, many more people are going to die. The goal of social distancing is to slow down the spread so we don't reach our peak all at once. We hit a, we have a slow peak, and you might have heard the term flatten the curve. And that is the goal, is to make it so that infections happen over a longer period of time so that we don't at any one time overwhelm our healthcare system. 
The other virus I want to talk about today is Ebola virus. Um, Ebola virus causes the disease Ebola virus disease or EVD. EVD is a highly fatal hemorrhagic fever. So hemorrhagic means that you're bleeding internally. This disease was first discovered or first noted in Western medicine in 1976. So it's about 40 years old. Um, since 1976, there have been occasional outbreaks that usually have occurred in rural places in Africa. And those outbreaks start when the virus jumps from an animal in the forest to humans. And that usually happens through some kind of direct contact between an animal and human. And these, these outbreaks have occurred every few years, but they're usually fairly well isolated to rural communities. And the reason they stay isolated is because in order for Ebola virus to spread, you have to have direct contact with a symptomatic patient. So if you, the strategy for dealing with these outbreaks has been to isolate the cases, and eventually the virus um, will, will die out of the population. This all changed in 2014 when there was a massive Ebola outbreak. So this was a huge outbreak that started in West Africa in Guinea but the the cases of illness were able to get into large population centers including the capitals of guinea sierra leone and liberia and that exposed many many more people to the disease to the disease and as you can see in this table um the number of cases went up really high um guinea had nearly 4000 liberia and sierra leone were even harder hit so over the course of 2 years there were over 28,000 cases of Ebola that occurred. So again, this is orders of magnitude more than we have seen on previous outbreaks. You can see that the death toll is very high. So of those cases, over 11,000 people died. And it took over two years to contain this outbreak. So I posted a film to Canvas that I would like you to watch. And this film highlights the experience of a pop-up medical clinic that was set up by Doctors Without Borders and just shows some of the effects of the Ebola disease on the population in West Africa. After you watch that video, make sure you go back to our um, page for today's lab. There's a link to a discussion board. I'd like you to write a post comparing the current COVID-19 outbreak to the Ebola virus disease outbreak in 2014 to 2016. Everybody should list on that discussion page a similarity between the outbreaks and a difference between the outbreaks.